Thanks. All right, before starting the panel, um, as many people know, we lost someone in the law enforcement community last week, uh, Sh Sheriff Andrew Peary, who responded to a incident, went to rescue the victim, and was shot by the offender. If we could start with a moment of silence. With us today is the director of our Peace Officer Standards and Training Program, and uh, really doing exceptional work there. Bo Bougerie, who will be involved in these issues insofar as they intersect with law enforcement and our work at POST, but he wanted to share a few words uh, about Deputy Sheriff Perry um, for, for us to reflect on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Deputy Peary, uh, ironically, graduated from the academy in Bakersfield, California, eight years ago yesterday. It was exactly eight years ago that uh, he graduated the academy and his memorial service was yesterday. Uh, he was an Army veteran, served three tours of duty in Iraq, served at the Bakersfield Police Department for two years before laterally over to the El Paso County Sheriff's Office here in Colorado where he served honorably um, multiple awards during his service in the Army, uh, many more accommodations and awards, um, one that hadn't even been uh, presented to him yet while with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Deputy Peary um, was, is survived by his wife, Megan, his son, Matthew, and his daughter, Amy, uh, who are both in high school. So if we can just keep uh, positive thoughts in our heads for El Paso County Sheriff's Office, uh, Deputy Peary and his family. Thank you. For those who don't know about it, there's an organization, both the Fallen Heroes Foundation, is that, yes, sir. that provides support for those who lose a loved one in service in law enforcement. It is really an exceptional organization here in Colorado. Um, you can look for it and support it in whatever way you might be able to. We here are talking about a crisis that law enforcement has seen on the front lines for some time. And Heidi gave us an opening by noting how many different types of diversion programs there are. A couple of those were relating to medication assisted treatment efforts. Um, I'd like to talk about efforts to use medication assisted treatment for those in the criminal justice system and also start by um, maybe talking about co-responder programs. Denver is unique. They have a STAR program where only a behavioral professional shows up. I think others are looking at that. But co-responder programs are uh, in multiple jurisdictions around the state. Um, let me start with Sheriff Amy Fitzsimons. I'll induce people as they go. He's in Summit County. I know that's an area that you've invested in. Can you talk a little about how you've scaled that up, both the medication assist treatment and the co-responder? Because I think both of your efforts on that um, bear some attention. Thank you. Um, you want to talk about MAT first since you mentioned it first? Yeah, MAT first, then co-responder. Yep. So medication assisted treatment, we started doing uh, it in Summit County. Well, in 2016, I started doing it. Um, and it's been very successful in our jail, but uh, we, use, we don't have methadone in Summit County, but we do use Vivitrol and, and Suboxone. Um, but we also, uh, we did some other things too. I, I, I hired a mental health team in my jail that works for me and, uh, and, a, and a, uh, a medical team that works for, uh, that's contracted out. They're the ones that do the MAT, that administer the MAT, but it's our mental health team that works with that uh, with the medical team administering this program and providing the behavioral health services that go along with MAT. Uh, also, we do Accu Detox in the jail and we also do uh, EDMR. So, what does EDMR stand uh, for? EMDR. It's eye movement, somebody, eye movement. That's why I don't say that acronym. <laughs> but that's, can you say it a little louder? Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Spelled just that way too. <laughs> uh, but all these programs are very effective when used together because it's different strokes for different folks, obviously. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we have a community partner also in Summit County that, you know, we do a warm handoff to when someone uh, leaves the jail. Uh, that, that mental health team I was talking about has a case manager, a clinical case manager that works with it, uh, that does this warm handoff to make sure that they get handed off to the community mental health center and continue their treatment, whichever path they've chosen. And it works in reverse too. If we've got someone coming in the jail that has been out in the community and is on one of these uh, MATs, uh, it'll be it'll work in reverse. So um, if you're in the community and you're in recovery on medications to treatment, you can go to the jail and keep getting your treatment, not miss a beat, and not speak. So for those keeping score at home, I just want to underscore three separate programs: medication-assisted treatment in the jail with several. Behavioral health professionals work for the sheriff's department. Do they do both the co same, same group co-responder program and medication assisted treatment? So it's two different groups. One is modeled at you know the, our co-responder team. They work together. Uh, our co-responder team is kind of unique. Uh, AG was talking about the uniqueness of some of these teams. Co-responder I have found over the years is this big broad term that means a lot of things. Um, when I when I put together our team. You know, I research co-responders all over the country and specifically here also in Colorado and, and, and really ask some hard questions about what worked and didn't work with these teams and if they could rebuild them all over again, what would they do differently? And what we came up with is a plain clothes, plain car response. Uh, the the, uh, the on-scene response, and it's a county-wide response, so we go into all jurisdictions in Summit County. So what that has done is it, it has fundamentally changed law enforcement in Summit County. Law enforcement is trained now to recognize this mental health law enforcement nexus and immediately will crush one of these co-responder teams. Not only has it, has it benefited uh, law enforcement in the community because it's the appropriate response now to all of these law enforcement calls, but our uses of force have plummeted through the floor. I mean, they're almost non-existent, which is tremendous. Uh, so let me just unpack that. Prior to your co-responder program, um, correlation is not causation, but, but if it was, right. most uses of force would be because people were dealing with some behavioral health challenge. When you have a co-responder, you then have, again, correlation not causation, but possibly lessened the reason for force? Yes. Um, and then you mentioned the case manager as well. So um, the reason why I have Jamie on this panel, Summit County is not a very large county. When you compare it to the sweep of Colorado, what's the population, would you say? Uh, latest, about 35,000. 35,000. He's been able to create all three of those programs, and that was even before having settlement funds to underwrite any of it. Yeah. So it's, it's a good case study. By contrast, we've heard from your colleague to our Jefferson County DA, um, Alexis King, Leslie Dahlkamper on the earlier panel about what's happening in Jefferson County. The region includes Gilpin County as well as Clear Creek. Your judicial district includes um, Gilpin, but not Clear Creek. As you look at co-responder programs, MAT in the jail, and case management for reentry, um, you obviously have had a lot more resources than Jeffco. What, what have you guys been doing, and, and what should um, maybe folks be thinking about in that area? Sure, so with the, what we have been doing, um, our sheriff has um, an opioid unit um, that is responsive to those coming in to the jail with addiction. We have used Vivitrol since prior to uh, the uh, epidemic with success while in the jail, less success once someone is released. Um, we are also a tapered county and so it does sometimes limit um, the, our, our spending. And so one of the things that has happened is oftentimes it's community partners coming together to support efforts. We recently began a group called C3, which is a handoff from the jail back to the community. Um, it does not have to be, uh, it can be completely voluntary. I'm just getting some feedback. It can be completely voluntary and people can access the services ongoing and it does not report back to the criminal justice system. So it is really designed to help people rather than to be some form of enga further engagement with the justice system. Um, what we do find with Vivitrol is that folks are getting the first shot within the jail and uh, the next one is 
30 days out and really having a hard time having people get that follow-up that they need to really start making progress without kind of falling back down once they're out of custody. Um, and then there's also, of course, efforts that we do on the probation side. So that's where we are in, in Jeffco. Follow-up on that. Is probation and the Vivitrol shot in kind of separate universes, or is there any interconnection between them? Um, there's always community uh, and conversation. I, if someone is moving to the probation department, if they're able to fall and get what they need within that time period, there's support for it. Um, but we lose a lot of people in that transition between a jail um, and any ongoing services, whether they're moving into a structured um, uh, situation like probation or they're moving just back out into the community we lose a lot of people in that space so th this is something that at the state level we're looking how we support both jail to community and prison to community we are aware of how much room for error there is in that re-entry um, Jamie it sounds like maybe because you're a smaller county and you can keep track do you feel like you're largely keeping on track and reentry, or do you, do you see some room for error that you're struggling with as well? Uh, you know, I always think there's room for error because of the transitory population, but um, you know, we, we are really careful. We, we've got tremendous community partners, tremendous. Um, and without them, all of these programs would fail. But uh, you know, the, the thing with the, the transition back to the community or back into the jail, uh, our case management teams, whether it be the co-responder team or the jail team, uh, we don't drop anybody from case management unless they request to be dropped. So we will, we will try everything not to let that time period go by to keep them uh, sober. So it is interesting to note, I know that there are some smaller counties that say, smaller population, I wish they only had to drive an hour to treatment. But there's also smaller counties where it's easier to keep track of people. Um, you're in a smaller county, Kristen. You also have great community partners. Let me ask a, a, a adjacent question here. As you're working on these types of programs, co-responders, uh, MAT, and re-entry, one of the big challenges is stigma, and it's stigma on many sides. For law enforcement, suggesting a co-responder sometimes is not as natural, because some police officers want to say they view the world as criminals and victims, not necessarily someone struggling with substance abuse who ends up involved in the justice system, but might be able to find, uh, let's say, a way forward where they can avoid being um, incarcerated. How do you build that sense of empathy, and how do you help those who are struggling with addiction not view the law enforcement world or the criminal justice world as something that's just out to get them? Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Um... In Durango, where I live, and I'm the DA down there, um, you know, it, we've got great, a great team, great partners, great law enforcement, and one of the great resources we've been able to access is, is great training from the state. So uh, we've endeavored to get all of our law enforcement officers in the city of Durango trained under the CIT program, which is crisis intervention training, so that they can begin to identify in the field people who are having mental health issues, or substance abuse issues. Um, that really helps to kind of reroute the way that they interact with uh, these people, the citizens that they're, that they're coming across. Um, we've also helped to train our dispatch staff. And so dispatch begins to you know, have a set of criteria that they can work from where they will then dispatch a co-responder team instead of just a law enforcement officer. So when they're seeing evidence of drug addiction or drug use, um, that's reported as part of the initial call, they will route that to a co-responder team. Um, and that really builds a, a sense of empathy and understanding, uh, both on the, the, from the law enforcement response. When, when they show up with the co-responder or they come out uh, as a crisis intervention team trained officer, um, you know, they can approach it in a different way. They can de-escalate the situation. They can interact with empathy and compassion for the citizen that they've come across. And that builds trust. Um, so that, that's what we're really working on, is trying to get that training out to as many different organizations, uh, whether that be our sheriff or our city of Durango or our smaller municipalities. I think it's really important. So we're teeing up Chief Gordon for the next one here. Chief Gordon is on the post board 
the post board is making available the following training for across Colorado. I had to pull up the acronym here. The acronym is ICAT. It stands for Integrating Communications Assessment and Tactics. And the tagline is, it's a new way of thinking about use of force training for police officers, providing peace officers with successful uh, tools to diffuse incidents and to lead with empathy. Um, the mindset change we're talking about here is a significant one. Um, it sounds like you've made really great strides by having that training really robust. Co-responders, peace officers, those handling the dispatch centers, that's quite a accomplishment. Again, part of this community of practice idea is that people can learn from one another. And again, great communities, great leaders, but doing something like that in Durango, doing something like that in Summit, that means most communities, and we want to try to help make that support, can really elevate how they approach this crisis and learn from best practice. So I know how passionate you are, Chief, about training, um, and I, you know way more about ICAT than I do. Maybe just pick up this thread a little bit. Am I on? When it comes to um, training, uh, for many years, I've been in policing for uh, 27 years now, and for many years, um, our training was what you saw in the military commercials. It was go, 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 hut, 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 hut. But we didn't have problems um, shooting our guns and driving our cars. Where we ran into issues and where the civil rights, um, uh, the civil rights judgments come in are generally in the relational skills. Um, again, I've been a police officer for 27 years. I've never shot anybody. But I've got more range time in than you can imagine. So the relational skills, uh, if we expect to be uh, treated like professionals, uh, training in how to relate to people takes us a step further in that direction. Uh, most of the time what we do is talk to people. Uh, and while there, are, there aren't any magic words that can diffuse um, a situation when a person is in crisis, there's no training that you go to that's going to eliminate the need to use force. Because what we're there to do in many, many instances is put shackles on people and take away their freedom. Uh, some people are going to fight that. Um, but what ICAT and uh, de-escalation and non-escalation training does is it enhances uh, the professional skills of responders so that they're not making situations worse. And it's extremely important. Uh, it's, it's, easily one of the most important things uh, that we can do. Do you have a co-responder program in Thornton right now? We do not have a co-responder program in Thornton. And I don't want to make anybody angry, but where I am is a mental health desert. Um, uh, our community partner uh, that is our crisis resource is having, uh, just like other professions, is having Difficulty, difficulty with staffing right now. So they've withdrawn a lot of their services. What we rely on are emergency rooms. So I'm meeting with one of the large hospitals uh, next week uh, to talk about implementing uh, a, a, a co-responder partnership. It's coming. Uh, we have a grant pending with DOLA and uh, so it's coming. But finding that mental health practitioner uh, might be a struggle where I am. Uh, but I, I am a fan of it. We have 22 law enforcement agencies that we work with in um, the first judicial district. And we have a number of well-funded departments who are really struggling to staff up. And that inability to fully staff a department and then to also staff co-responder programs of which we do have is a real struggle. And so while I have chiefs of police who are dedicated to finding alternative ways to respond and divert, we just are really struggling on the ground to have enough staff both on the um, sworn peace officer side and also then on the mental health side. And I'm not even as far north or outside of the metro as, as Thornton and we're still facing some of those struggles. So I think that's real and that is something that we all need to, to, to be fully cognizant of as we think about these alternatives. So after this panel, I said a clear priority, the re-entry we talked about. The workforce development is on our agenda for the statewide funds. How can we bring more professionals into communities? We 
here at this point again and again. I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge we have a major shortage of peace officers right now. A number of jurisdictions literally are about 50% of their authorized needs. And we're working hard on recruitment and retention and providing mental health services for peace officers as well. Uh, and just if you had to complete this, uh, the stories about teachers are also uh, alarming about shortages there too. So we, we have a lot of work as a state to do for these critical public servants who we depend on, how we bring them into our communities. Uh, Brian, let me give you the last word on this topic of MAT co-responders and re-entry. What have you been seeing in your judicial district? You cover all of Adams County and Broomfield. So I'll just comment on something that you mentioned earlier, and that was the perceived reluctance sometimes amongst law enforcement to adopt co-responder programs. My experience has actually been the opposite. My experience is that police officers feel that they are being asked to do things that they have not been trained to do and that their responsibilities as police officers go way beyond preserving the peace but, but, go, but include now responding to mental health crises. And so my experience has been they welcome co-responder programs. They want the help. It's an issue of resources, and it's an issue of getting programs started up in jurisdictions that are having trouble just getting police officers on the beat, much less starting a brand new program. And yet a co-responder program really can have a significant impact in addressing mental health crises instead of these folks coming into the criminal justice system trying to get them mental health services. And I'll also add to what Chief Gordon said, this is where training is so critical. I haven't seen reluctance on behalf of police officers to be part of co-responder programs, but they don't have the training. And so when a police officer responds to a scene and somebody presents as in crisis, but also as a safety risk, the police officer is trained to mitigate the safety risk. And sometimes their very presence in a police uniform can be triggering to someone having a mental health problem. And, and yet, if that person is triggered and then waves a weapon at the police officer, the police officer is then trained to mitigate that threat. So th that's a, a vicious cycle that is dangerous and, and another really compelling argument for why co-responder programs are important. I'll add just a couple other things. Um, we have a couple co-responder programs in Adams and, and Broomfield. Broomfield's been piloting one. Aurora has been piloting one. Um, but I, I do think for us, part of the front lines in dealing with the opioid crisis and dealing with people who do intersect into the criminal justice system with mental health problems is our diversion program. And I imagine you're going to get to that in a second. But diversion is one of the best opportunities that we have as a district attorney's office to try to keep people out of the criminal justice system who don't belong in it and to try to get them treatment and help and not have a criminal record and not be coming into court. The other thing that I've been working on, and it's still a work in progress, is creating a mental health specialty court in the 17th Judicial District. We have a mental health program. It's called CEASE. It's based in our probation department but it lacks the oomph that comes with a judge. It lacks the credibility that comes with having somebody actually appear in front of a court and have particular deadlines of accountability and incentives for staying out of incarceration. And so that's another thing that we're working on. Specialty courts, I think, are tremendously effective for things like drugs, we've got a drug court, for veterans, but it requires resources. And the dearth of folks who are coming into this profession is impacting us, not just at the police officer level, it impacts me at the DA's office. I'm struggling to recruit attorneys. Um, and we're struggling to at, over at the courthouse to recruit and pay and retain competent clerks because they, the state doesn't pay very well. And if I don't have the infrastructure, even at the courthouse, to keep our, our regular courts operating, my suggestion that we should create a new one 
a mental health court is immediately shot down because there just doesn't, aren't the resources to do it. All right, so keeping score at home, when you have a co-responder show up, it's less likely to use force, may less likely to an arrest. When you have someone come into interaction with the system who is struggling with addiction, having medication-assisted treatment can be a game changer, and then having an effective re-entry plan with a case manager can make a big difference. Brian added another point I did want to get to, which is there are strategies on the front end, either what you might call a pre-arrest diversion or post-arrest diversion. There's a program called Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Lead Grants that a number of communities have gotten to try to take, if you will, a load off the criminal justice system and have it carried by drug treatment and recovery programs. That takes, as Brian just adverted to, resources to be able to administer such a program. And sometimes communities that are struggling with personnel or just managing the day-to-day -day aren't as well able to make such programs work. Um, Brian, you brought up, so I'll let you go first. Uh, anything you want to talk about diversion programs you've been doing in Adams County? Yeah, so our, our diversion program in the 17th is one of the oldest in the state. It was founded in the late 70s. And we're very fortunate in my jurisdiction to have such a big, large, effective program. This isn't true statewide or nationwide, and I feel really lucky. We have really invested in, not just since I've taken office, but before, expanding that program. And the, and the point of a diversion program is to try to divert somebody who has been accused of a crime, but doesn't necessarily belong in the court system, doesn't belong in the criminal justice system. And this can run the gamut. It, it's people who have addiction problems, mental health problems, criminogenic issues, family issues, but whose level of crime is not so high that I can't safely put that person into a diversion program, get them the support and services they need, <laughs> and keep them out of the criminal justice system altogether. And that's really our goal. We spend money on incarcerating people across this country in, in staggering amounts. But when we can take some of those resources to keep people out of the criminal justice system, that ultimately is an investment in our communities that saves money over time. But it is tricky um, because we, in our program, we have really high standards. And folks have to go through this very extensive program and, and, if, and pass it. Now, I'm also very proud to say that when we have folks go through diversion and they graduate, their recidivism rate, I should say, after three years, 97% of them have stayed out of the criminal justice system. So it's a staggeringly high success rate if we can get them into the program and get them through it. We also have a diversion program uh, down in the 6th Judicial District. Um, we divert about 10% of our eligible cases to diversion, which, um, you know, in a day and age when the court systems are very overburdened, uh, is a huge help. Uh, these people don't need to be in the criminal justice system. Um, and specifically applying it to people with substance abuse disorder or substance use disorder, um, you know, we provide treatment access. And I think. You know, there's the old adage, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? We, we don't force people to do treatment. What we do is we provide them connections, resources, and supports. So we integrate them into our uh, substance abuse treatment programs through our local mental health providers. Um, we ask them to, to complete an evaluation. That's the only mandatory piece um, for, a, for a, a drug case that's going to be diverted. They have to do an evaluation, and then they get to make the choice. And what we've seen is that when they're connected to those resources, they generally avail themselves of those opportunities. They, they choose it. Uh, not always, uh, but the people who do choose it are ready for it. And those are the people that are, we're seeing a really high level of success with. So, you know, we could always use more resources. We could always use more money for, re, for, for treatment and, for, and, you know, something more local. I mean, down in Durango, it's a six-hour drive to a, a treatment center for re inpatient rehabilitation uh, in either Grand Junction or Pueblo. But um, we found creative ways to partner uh, and, and find solutions. Um, and we're really proud of what we've done. With the work of their committee, God willing, there will be a very close 
drug treatment facility because the difficulty you're putting in front of someone by making it six hours away is substantial. Um, Alexis, what about your uh, jurisdiction and uh, diversion programs? So before I took office, we did not have any pre-filing diversion options. Uh, we worked closely with Adams and Boulder County to uh, revamp that. And so we are now um, at the point where we can offer more pre-file uh, diversion. We do our law, uh, law enforcement partners at the Lakewood Police Department have a law enforcement assisted diversion program um, that is in its infancy, but hoping to scale. Uh, and then we also, like Christian, we're really a risk-based diversion model. And so we want folks that we know can make it through without putting the community at risk, but we are also offering services and frankly letting folks be connected in order to really take that first step into recovery. Uh, we also have an addiction mental health and mental health court for higher risk, high needs population, um, which is when those courts are most appropriate. Um, though I will say when we have significant mental health issues, the question of success and maybe how state judicial would evaluate us is one that is nuanced um, because addiction is, and recovery is one thing, but mental health is often quite something, something else. So. I know we have at least two law enforcement leaders here with us, District Attorney Gordon McLaughlin, who's from Fort Collins, and uh, also in his jurisdiction, Chief uh, Rick Brandt, who's really a leader. I, I do want to say something, Chief. Uh, it's a tribute that uh, Brian's view is that people in law enforcement have gotten to a place that they readily embrace the value of co-responders. That's been a journey. When, when Rick started talking about Narcan and harm reduction, um, it wasn't exactly an open door he was pushing on. Um, now I believe it's become the norm that every law enforcement agency in the state um, pretty much is committed to having Narcan and, and your leadership, Rick, has made an extraordinary difference. You saw it, Rick, in the video. Let's give Rick a round of applause. So uh, I'll let uh, Jamie go first. Uh, having Narcan available for overdoses, sadly, is now more important than ever because of how deadly fentanyl is. In fact, even law enforcement officials themselves are having to have Narcan for them and their safety because fentanyl um, can actually spread pretty quickly. Uh, and so I, I'm curious, as you are approaching this, and I know you've been also on top of this, uh, how have you gotten Narcan as more of a um, widespread availability among all first responders? It's all Rick's fault. <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, Chief Brandt, uh, you know, originally uh, connected me, obviously, with, uh, with Narcan. Uh, and we've got all some of the county law enforcement and all public safety, EMS, fire, EMS, everyone carrying Narcan. Uh, we give it away at the sheriff's office. We have big signs saying, ask for free Narcan. Uh, and we also give it to every inmate as they're leaving the jail. We put it in their bag and little go bag of Narcan. So it's been, a, it's been really successful. We've revived uh, many people, uh, saved some lives even there in the courthouse. Uh, even our, our court security staff carries it. Uh, so it's been a really successful for us. And I, I do, all joking aside, I do credit Rick because I reached out to him uh, right away and uh, we started our program with with little resistance. It's worth noting, it's one of the great things about Colorado, we see this in the post board, how many people in law enforcement dedicate so much time above and beyond their day job to do things like what Rick has done. It's, it's made a huge difference. Um, Terrence, you, um, I expect your team also has Narcan, uh, everyone, uh, every officer? Yes, um, I'm um, fairly new to Colorado. Been here about a year and a half. And it was, uh, it was already implemented when I got to Thornton. I do remember back around 2013 when it was implemented at my um, uh, former agency in my hometown. Um, there was no pushback. There were people in the community who thought it was a waste of money. Obviously, those people didn't know anybody suffering from addiction. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's been a godsend. Um, it's, it's sad that we have to carry this. Um, there are people that officers, individuals that officers and firefighters have, revolved, have revived numerous times, uh, but those human beings would be dead right now if it wasn't for 
naloxone. So I want to change related topic because as we've seen this epidemic go into its third wave, I mentioned earlier how deadly fentanyl is and the need for greater awareness. You've seen that, Brian, up close in your jurisdiction. How do you see us better elevating our messaging and getting out this awareness campaign about the deadly nature of fentanyl and any drug that it can be in? Fentanyl is without question the most dangerous drug on the streets right now. And those who are most at risk of instant death from fentanyl are our young people, middle school students, high school students, college kids who are for their very first time trying a drug not knowing that it may have fentanyl in it, having absolutely no tolerance for it, and then never waking up and dying. I think many people have seen stories about fentanyl on the news. Unfortunately, several of those are from my jurisdiction. We have one of the largest cases in the country of fentanyl poisoning that came out of Commerce City, where five people died of fentanyl when they thought they were taking cocaine. And they had a four-month-old baby in the, in the apartment, and both parents died. But I have found, to answer your question, that despite those news stories, and despite how often you see reports of fentanyl poisoning and overdoses, there are still a lot of people who don't know what fentanyl is or who don't know how dangerous it is. I've been trying to go around to city councils in my jurisdiction, and I went to the Brighton City Council last week and just talked about fentanyl. And these are elected officials who really care about their community, and more than half of the Brighton City Council really had no idea how dangerous fentanyl was. And, and suddenly we're really motivated to go talk to their constituents about it. I think that's what we have to do. We have to try to find ways to get into schools, to get into churches, to get into community centers, and have absolutely across the board, everyone who has an audience, make sure that you share with that audience the lethality and danger of fentanyl. I was fortunate enough to participate on the Governor's Council on Human Trafficking, uh, which was started a number of years ago. And they have had an incredibly successful state-level uh, campaign awareness that what took into account survivor voices, professional voices, law enforcement voices. Um, if you ever, if you, you've probably seen them. They're sandwiched often in the evening news. It's, this is human trafficking. And they are very well done without being, um, um, well, frankly, kind of distasteful. Um, and I think that something similar on the statewide level would be as effective. Um, it took a lot of work, but it did have everyone who was necessary at the table. And it's factually accurate and really hits to the nuance of what human trafficking is. And I think we need the same thing around fentanyl. I also think that, frankly, one of the pushes should be that test strips like Narcan years ago is kind of destigmatized as a way for helping people survive. So just a little add on there. Our local community uh, down in Durango, uh, it, you know, we don't have the horsepower to, to have some kind of high level campaign that's rolled out from the executive branch. It's all about partnerships. So for us, it's our uh, local public health organization, San Juan Basin Health our local community uh, mental health provider, um, and you know, bringing together all these different organizations to roll out a plan. Um, even events just like this. I, I sat yesterday and I listened to the work of uh, Sophie Pfeffer, uh, Maggie Seldin, uh, the work that they're doing to roll out uh, awareness, uh, but also roll out fentanyl test strips, clean needles, um, awareness about fentanyl. We're going to be integrating into our community a safe needle exchange, uh, fentanyl test strips, uh, and I was even talking with Dr. Dr. Valak, I think is his name. He told me, he said he had a great quote, he said, anybody, everybody who leaves a jail, hospital, library, grocery store should have a Narcan applicator duct taped to their head. And I asked him, well, what kind of training does it need? And he said, if you can squeeze your fingers together, you can administer Narcan. It's 100% safe. There's absolutely no side effects. There's no danger whatsoever. We should be putting it out in every 
DA's office, every courthouse, every public access point should have Narcan available, should have fentanyl test strips available. So these are the kind of things that if we as the leaders on these topics can push it out in that way, it will change the stigma around it and it will change the public perception and it will increase safety and save lives. Yeah, just add one more thing. Uh, the best messengers on the dangers of fentanyl are not law enforcement. It's the families of those who have lost loved ones to it. And I have been working with parents who have lost kids to fentanyl poisoning, and their stories will scare every single parent that ever hears them. I know um, District Attorney Michael Allen from Colorado Springs is here today. He's having an event, I think next week or the week after, on fentanyl, um, where some family members who were, who were just in my jurisdiction last week will be participating. They are the most powerful storytellers about how dangerous this is. Apologies, D. Allen on C over there. Good to have you with us. Any other police chiefs or sheriffs here, by the way, other than Rick Brandt? Because um, here's the question I want to end with. It's the question that we ended the regional council panel with. Law enforcement conversations on this are relatively nascent, I would say. The innovations that we heard about from Sheriff at Simons, from others, are still taking root. How do we better create shared understandings about these innovations and a sort of learning community of practice. Um, what, what are the best ways we can keep that conversation going? Um, have you been having conversations about what you're doing with others in what forms and how do we scale that up? So it, it is about conversations. It is about destigmatizing. It is about all of these things that we've talked about here today. Um, and, and, you know, doing what we've been, all of us here at the table, uh, have been elected to do and that is to lead. Uh, you know, when we talked about Narcan, Narcan, fentanyl strips, harm reduction, you know, Summit County, again, is trying to be a leader in this. I see our public health director, Amy Weiland, back there that is like the harm reduction queen. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, but we've partnered on a lot of things for years uh, in the opioid crisis, even starting with drug take back. And now we're evolving into talking about fentanyl test strips and drug checking machines and safe disposal and all these words that traditionally law enforcement uh, or afraid of, um, but we gotta not be afraid and lead, and as, as we talked about, and save lives. Chief, uh, for us at Post, there's a lot to think about here in terms of the, the training, the awareness. Um, any thoughts you have about how we best scale this up and, and push it forward? Yeah, a lot of thoughts. <laughs> how much time do we have? When it comes to training, um, police officers take the training like uh, like like babies to milk. Um, we've just got to, we get a good curriculum in front of them. That's the infusion there. The state right now, along with many states in the country, we have a tremendous opportunity right now to actually finally make a change. The, over, the, overdose, the overdose deaths are increasing upon increases, sometimes upon record increases. We know what works, but for some reason we won't do it. We're not gonna arrest our way out of an addiction issue. We're not gonna arrest our way out of overdoses. What works when it comes to addiction and when it comes to mental illness is long-term inpatient treatment that neither insurance companies nor governments are willing to pay for. We don't need any more money. We have the money we need. What we have is a lack of focus. We give people their naloxone, we give people their methadone, and we tell them to go out there and be somebody. But we send them back to the exact same environment that they came from. If we, once we start treating the whole person, we will start seeing some results. <laughs> And just to put a fine point on it, your brain is not the same. It takes time for the brain to heal, which is why that impatient for longer is so important. And the other thing I'd add to that is the recovery connections, recovery coaches are so important because often it's that lack of connection to sobriety that people need. So um, final word, former uh, head of our DA's council, as we think about the DA community, Christian, any final points you want to add about how we 
um, make sure to, we've got five DAs here in this room here. Obviously, it's a incredibly impressive showing, but anything you'd want to add? Well, you know, just like we talked at the beginning about leading with empathy uh, from the law enforcement perspective and the initial contact, that needs to run throughout the entire court system. That means the prosecutors need to treat people with respect and understanding, that the courts need to treat people with respect and understanding, and that, you know, the sentences or the, 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 the tools that we give people are not about punishment always. Sometimes that's a part of it, but it needs to be about opportunities to access those resources and, and heal and get better. Um, so we have to be versatile, we have to be nimble, and we have to have those opportunities across the state. All right, please join me. Thank you, an outstanding panel. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Such a great panel. Thanks for coming, whether from near or from far. So <laughs> appreciate that. Um, all right. So